Well, uh, thank you for coming. I, I'm Barry Peters, and I'm a member of the barn, a recent member, and I'm a member of, of ETA. And I felt that it would be really fun to talk to people who are members of a maker space, like this is, uh, about the concept of making radio programs, uh, sometimes called podcasts, sometimes called digital audio, sometimes called new media, um, as distinct from old-time radio and old-time recording studios and old-time analog techniques. And so what I really want to talk about um, is an experience I had over the last three days where I went to visit a three-day conference of traditional radio. Community radio stations, 26 of them met at Olympic College, at, Ever at Evergreen College in Olympia. And it made me think how far we've come in the transition from analog to digital. And it also made me think that we on Bainbridge Island are on the right track when we set up a radio station in the form of a digital podcast station. So I'll give you a secret preview of my hidden agenda, and that is I would love to persuade any of you guys to take part in this activity. Jonathan is one of our volunteers. Hi. Uh, Jonathan Coonan is in Bainbridge High School. And what, going into 11th grade, right? No, uh, 10th grade. 10th grade, amazing. Uh, and Jonathan is smarter about this stuff than I am, and that's why I asked him to come here. Um, and Jonathan is, is, a, is one of the high school volunteers who works with us in our maker space, which is a studio not far from here. It's over uh, at the... Uh, Hildebrand part of the Safeway Shopping Center. And we chose that spot because it's a five minute walk from the high school and the library. So let me give you an introduction to the topic of digital audio for makers and see if this resonates with you. And this is very informal as you know and I hope you'll just ask questions as we go along. Um, it occurred to me in the last three days that there have been about five big trends that have occurred over the last hundred years in kind of 50-year chunks. One of them is a transition from analog to digital. And I'll explain more about what I mean by that in a minute. Another is in the hardware area where, hi, where vacuum tubes have transitioned to solid-state devices. And secondly, those solid-state devices like transistors, which came out from AT&T Labs in about 1954, have themselves transitioned to integrated circuits. And that has led to a transition from hardware that is huge to hardware that is miniaturized. And it's also enabled those components to be so small and compact that they can be wireless. So what do we mean when we talk about analog to digital? Well, I've got a couple of movies here that try to explain that. Let me play the first one, which is about audio waveforms, which when we teach about them, we usually teach, of, teach them as sine waves, as compressions and rarefactions of the air between some device and your ear, for example, is a good, is a good uh, analogy. So let's go to analog versus digital, and let's play this. It's, it's kind of corny, but you'll get the idea. The difference between analog and digital recording is? Oh no, oh no, tell us Mr. Audio, oh 
I'm Mr. Audio. The difference between an analog and a digital recording is how sound is represented on the recording medium. In an analog recording, the electrical wave that represents the sound varies in a way that is the same or analogous to the actual compression expansion cycles of sound itself. Therefore, it's known as analog. When this signal is reproduced, the electrical wave is converted back into acoustical energy in the headphones or speakers. Any random noise generated by the recording medium, mainly tape hiss, is reproduced along with the original sound. In a digital recording, the sound wave is sampled at a constant rate, typically in multiples of either 44.1 or 48 kilohertz. And these pulses are recorded at a selected bit depth, generally 16, 24, or 32 bit. When the digital signals are reproduced, any noise generated by the recording medium is not. However, that doesn't mean that all digital recordings are noise free. In fact, low level digital recordings can have noise just as analog recordings. Thanks, Mr. Audio. <laughs> For more uh, interesting facts about sound, visit Mr. Audio at soundimages.com. In this, um, in this uh, video, you notice the sine wave, um, which is usually an analog sine wave, is, um, is represented by a number of digital pieces. And in our world of podcasting, we sample that analog signal, like our voice, 44,100 times a second. So what does that mean in terms of sound quality? Uh, we, first of all, we use that sampling rate because it's become a standard in computers that download audio, whether they're Windows or, or uh, Macs. Uh, it turns out that most audio players are tuned to expect a digital uh, program to come in at a sampling rate of 44,100 cycles per second or hertz. And so when this sh show talks about sampling, notice they've put in these vertical lines. So let's take an example of middle C on the piano. Ah. Uh, 440 cycles per second. So if you're sampling 44,100 times a second, that's about 100 samples of each cycle. So it gives you a way of breaking down the sound into bite-sized pieces that a computer can process and, and record as a series of sampling uh, volumes and frequencies. So that's what I think he's getting at when he talks about these points. Um, and when he talked about the sampling rate of 44,100, that's what we use, that number on top. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention about the transition from analog sine waves to digital numeric data is why would you do it? Why would you care? Well, it turns out that in the old days of radio, when you wanted to send a voice across the geography, you were making the electromagnetic uh, frequency oscillate in the same way as the voice that you had recorded. And that takes a lot of energy, and it involves a lot of degradation over time and space. So engineers found that if they used digital um, signals, that that digital signal could carry with high fidelity over a greater distance and withstand the degradation over time and space. <laughs> so let's watch this movie about that point. And this is, this is the history of sound recording. Uh, it goes very quickly, but it it will illustrate that over about a hundred years, there's been a remarkable transition of miniaturization and digitalization of devices that record the human voice. Eighteen twenty seven, a microphone. 
1859 sound recordings. And look how bulky and how hard it would have been to use these things. Also, how hard to modify and edit. So, 1878, a telephone using a microphone with Thomas Edison. Jukeboxes from 1889. Gramophone discs. Magnetic recording became the basis for editing tape. Seventy-eight RPM records. So, nineteen oh six broadcasting and a radio station in nineteen twenty in Pittsburgh. So, sound began to be incorporated into visuals in the form of soundtracks on film. Car radio, Motorola's car radio, 1930. Binaural sound became stereo sound. And FM started replacing AM because it was clearer when there was electrical interference. And we had vinyl LPs. And then 45s. And that bred institutions of commercial radio. And back when I went to college in the 1960s, radio stations used reel to reel tape, which to edit, you actually had to cut the tape with a razor blade and tape the two pieces together in a different place. <laughs> Quite different from today's recording software. Eight tracks, digitally recorded LPs and digital audio workstations. compact discs that are digital and then a whole host of digital equipment uh, hardware and software so you can think of the transition of analog to digital in going from this which is analog and if you got out of a microscope and looked at the grooves, they are wiggling back and forth. And they are causing a needle, a stylus, to wiggle back and forth, which acts like the diaphragm of a microphone, causing compression and rarefaction similar to an analog sound coming through the air. So these LPs were analog devices. And then, 30 years later, these CDs were digitally recorded. And when you look at the surface of this, you won't see a wiggle. What you actually have in the very, very small microscopic etchings on this surface are binary representations of digital data. So th that's one of the big differences between old recording techniques and new recording techniques. And we make use of that in our podcast studio when we make digital recordings. So in the old days, bulky, huge equipment designed to drive electromagnetic waves in an analog way, which had big losses over time and space, big antennas. Antennas like this were typically upwards of 50,000 watts. And the whole metal structure of the tower was the antenna. 
it's not just a little stick on top. It's the whole antenna which needed to be a reasonable fraction of the AM radio wavelength, which was typically about, oh, 1,600 feet or very big waves. And these things would typically be a half wave long or a quarter wavelength long. The whole antenna, therefore, would oscillate with the electromagnetic drive of the 50,000 watt transmitter. Here locally, uh, you can still see on Vashon Island, just south of us, the KIRO, Cairo uh, studio, which is the 50,000 watt transmitting location for our 50,000 watt Cairo radio station, AM radio station which has been charged by the FCC as being our Puget Sound emergency radio station because of its power and its news orientation. Back in the old days, in the 1930s, they built this kind of um, maybe Art Deco studio. Back in the days when there was so much invested in this equipment that you had military guards guarding the place. Not the sort of environment like the barn where you come and do creative work in a very nice, informal, loosey-goosey way. Uh, I've actually visited this studio. It's still there. It is tumbling down around you. Even though in its day it was a huge investment, today it's still putting out 50,000 watts, but it's not being well maintained. So in the last three days, I, I visited with a number of community radio stations, and this is one of them. Uh, this is the Port Townsend community radio station, which, as compared to our podcast studio, is relatively complex and big, and has, like this whole area, is a set of racks of hardware equipment that is driving a transmitter off-site which is a many thousand watt transmitter for FM radio throughout Jefferson County. So what's the contrast to what we're doing today at Bainbridge Community Broadcasting? Well, we're making radio shows using very simple, generally digital equipment, digital hardware and digital software. So in these pictures, typically what you need is a good quality microphone. In front of the microphone is a pop filter so that when you speak into the microphone with your voice up close to it, your P's and B's won't make little explosions into the microphone. Because it is an analog device. It is sensing the movement of the air back and forth. And what happens as this signal goes to the computer is it goes through an analog to digital converter. In our studio, we have that inside a mixer box made by a company called Mackey. But basically, the tool you need is the, a good quality microphone with a large diaphragm that responds sensitively to movements of sound waves in air. It helps to wear headphones, uh, if only because with dynamic microphones like these, there's a big difference between the way your voice sounds when you're up close to it versus far away, and the headphones help you to hear that difference. We also do a lot of interviews, a host interviewing a guest. So if both the host and the guest were headphones, it's a great way for the conversation to really be what you're paying attention to. Where does that signal go? The signal goes through the analog to digital converter and goes into a multi-track recording software program. And the reason I asked Jonathan to join me today is I want to give you two different examples of digital, what, what are called uh, DAWs, digital audio workstations, right? <laughs> well, that's, that's, in the, that's what they're called in, in the software world. And by setting up those multiple tracks side by side, you can edit each track, like the host voice and the guest voice, separately. So if it's a male host and a female guest, you can, you can massage the sound in 
this software differently for the two different people. Um, another example of a multiple channel device is this one, which we use when we're out in the field. And this is what's called a Zoom digital recorder made by a company called Zoom. It has six potential inputs, left and right stereo, left and right stereo, and four professional audio inputs that come in through these XLR connectors. And when they are connected at the other end to a high quality microphone, and we sometimes use this one when we're in the field, this can generate a multiple track recording my voice and your voice. And, and what you mean, what it takes to do that is two microphones, is that correct? Uh, yeah. One, one, one track for one audio source. Some reporters use one mic and, sh and share it back and forth. Uh -huh. But for our purposes, when we're making a podcast that's an audio program to listen to over the internet, mm -hmm. we prefer to have the different speakers on different tracks, different voices on different tracks, so that when we edit and do voice enhancement, and when we um, use special effects like resonance and compression and, and other features like that, we can do it specifically as applied to one voice or the other. On the most simple level, it's being able to pick out the silence, you know, the dead air that just has the echo or a bit of fuzz maybe to it when a person isn't speaking and being able to just completely remove that so it makes the person who is speaking as clear and crisp as possible. Mm-hmm. Because we are working on clarity. So do I said... handle that? Oh, yeah, yeah, please do. Um, so I said in the, um, in the email advertising this session that I would show you a way to make high-quality recordings for under $100. The key missing ingredient for most people is a good microphone. And this microphone is very interesting because it's only $60. It's been rated very highly by a lot of the podcasters in the United States who tend to have podcast shows that rate the equipment and rate the software. What's also interesting about this is it's two mics in one. It has an analog to digital converter inside it and so if you plug into this port, that's a USB port, and I currently have this mic plugged in directly to this digital laptop using the digital USB port. Alternatively, I could take that device, which is calling for a high quality analog microphone, and plug it into this XLR three pin socket, and it's just an analog mic feeding that digital device, which has an analog to digital converter built into it. So, so those are, there's a simple device under $100 that when connected to your laptop enables you to essentially produce high quality sound directly into software that's designed to receive that sound, record it, and edit it. Uh, so there's an example of Bainbridge Community Broadcasting going to the farmer's market and interviewing people on Earth Day with that microphone and passing it back and forth in this case. Um, and he's, were you using for a recorder in that case? We were using the Zoom. Zoom yeah. yeah. Um, included in your $100 maybe, especially if you have friends who have used foam, is acoustic foam because the typical problem of making recordings in your home or in a typical space is echo off the wall which makes your voice muddy it makes it sound like you're in a barn no pun intended uh, you know and it and it it's lacking in clarity whereas with this with this kind of egg crate type of foam you can have the walls be more absorbent and you get that hushed sound that studios like to have. Here's a, a really interesting device 
that for people who wanted, who might want to make digital recordings at home, and I must say, of the hundreds of thousands of podcasts in America today, a great many of them are made by one person, and many of them are made in their own home. Sometimes in a closet with lots of coats around to, to dampen the sound. This device would let you sit at a desk and speak into it and have that hush sound of a studio. It's not perfect, obviously. It's about $100. But it's better than bouncing your voice off the walls right in front of your computer. So there's been quite a transition over the 100 years and even over 50 years from radios that were fixed pieces of furniture that rooted you to your chair to listen to them versus digital devices that are wireless that enable a person to be out and listening on the move to audio. And our statistics tell us that Bainbridge Community Broadcasting, when we send out podcasts, even here on Bainbridge Island, where most of us are not that age, um, young people like Jonathan get this already. When I asked teenagers at last summer's teen radio camp what radio show they listened to, they said, mm, not so much. And then I said, well, how about podcasts? And they had several ideas. So kids get it. But even overall on Bainbridge Island, when we send our podcasts out through many channels, our statistics tell us that more than half the listeners have downloaded the podcast on a mobile, typically Apple, device. More than half. That's kind of amazing to me here on Bainbridge, considering when I go to church, everybody walks up to me and says, now how do I listen to your radio? What, where is it on the dial? And I say, no dial. You need an, an internet connected device. And, okay, so what's happened in the world as a result of this phenomenal change from analog to digital and portable devices? A new entertainment form called podcasts has emerged. And today, there are literally hundreds of thousands of these programs called podcasts. These are the four that are probably the most popular nationally. Last year, there was quite a phenomenon, a podcast called Serial, which consisted of 12 episodes, nonfiction, describing an actual 1999 murder that occurred in a Baltimore high school uh, where a, an Islamic boy was accused of being the murderer of an Asian girl. That podcast had five million listeners. I was one of them. And those 12 episodes were gripping because it was nonfiction told by a person who had done all the research to figure out 14 years later, was he really guilty? Was he framed? Was, you know, and it was gripping. It was great storytelling. And storytelling is the heart of podcasts. And that's why This American Life is typically rated number one in, in the United States, because it's a wonderful storyteller. Ivor Glass of NPR and then of This American Life is a wonderful storyteller. And NPR has found that they are now financially doing better on podcasts than on their FM broadcasts. Mm -hmm. Very good. 